Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here for an introduction to vectors specifically in 2D space. And vectors in two dimensional space are going to be vectors with two components or two entries in them. A lot of what we talk about here will apply to vectors in more than two dimensions, but I think it's easiest to look at two dimensional examples first. The typical definition we hear for a vector in our first encounter is often the one we see here that it's some kind of quantity that has information about direction and magnitude. You might see these in an introductory physics or trigonometry setting as a force that's applied to an object or a straight path to be traveled by an object. For linear algebra, we'll think of these more generally simply as an ordered list of quantities. That doesn't mean we won't still use them as a force acting on an object. Certainly we will sometimes. But beyond the idea of force and paths, there are a great number of applications for vectors and their solutions. I've listed only a handful of them here, so we'll just tend to think of vectors as an ordered list. The way we know that we're talking about vectors here with V and W that are shown is this half arrow notation over the name of the vector. Many people use a full arrow instead. That tells us that we're not talking about a variable V or W that we might solve for a specific value like in algebra. This reminds us, hey, these are vectors, and they have a list of quantities in them. Uh, these are a very different kind of object than just what we think of as a variable. Textbooks and articles will sometimes denote a vector by using a bold print V or a bold print W, but when we're writing things by hand, it'll usually be the case that we use some kind of arrow notation. There are three fairly common ways to see vectors written. On the left here, this is a pretty standard way to see vectors for the first time in the ordered set notation, or sometimes called a bracket notation. The components are listed in order from left to right in angled brackets, and this also helps us realize we're not talking about the point 3, 2 here for V, which would be given in round parentheses. The brackets tell us that this is a path that travels three units horizontally, and two units vertically, for example, for V. One notation for vectors that's used a bit more in calculus and physics is the unit vector notation. This notation writes the vector path as a combination of unit vectors that travel parallel to our coordinate axes in space. Matrix notation is the one we'll be using most often in our linear algebra series of videos, thinking of the vector as a matrix that's a single column with the entries given vertically in order. So we won't focus very much for now on the unit vector notation. We'll more so be focusing on the other two and really be using the matrix notation the most out of all of these. Starting with vectors in 2D space is nice because we can visually represent them pretty easily. Here we've defined two vectors. One of them we're calling vector V and its components are three and two. We also have another vector named w with components negative 1 and 4, and we've got them sketched in the xy plane over here. Let's look at some super basic operations with vectors that we'll need in order to move forward with some ideas. So the first being addition of vectors. If we want to add vectors v and w, then we'll add them component-wise. The first component of v will add with the first component of w. And the same will happen with the second component. So here, the 3 and the negative 1 add together to give us 2, and the 2 and the 4 add together to give us 6. You can tell from this maybe that in order for vector addition to make sense, the vectors need to have the same number of entries in them. We can also picture this happening in our matrix notation. V plus W will give us the addition of the top components and the addition of the bottom components. Same answer, just a different way of writing it. Let's look at how this works visually. If we think of a vector as traveling a path, then V plus W would mean traveling path V, and then wherever we end up, traveling path W from there. So over here, if we travel path V from the origin and stop at 3, 2, then from that point travel path W, that takes us to a new location. And if we draw a vector that goes from the origin to that final location in the plane, that'll be the vector we get when we find vector V plus vector W. Over here you can see that traveling vector v and then vector w gave us an end location of 2, 6, just like our addition. 
So think about what would happen if we added the vectors in the opposite order. If we compute, say, w plus v, then we're still adding the same two components together. And for this, since adding two real numbers can be done in either order and give us the same answer, we can tell the same will be true with vectors. In math, we call that the idea of being commutative. So our addition for vectors is commutative. Another good way to view how this is true is to think about traveling path w first this time, and then traveling path v. So if we travel path w and then v, you can see we arrive at the same point as when we traveled v and then w. Looking at both orders of doing the addition or traveling, you can see we get a parallelogram, and the diagonal of that parallelogram is our vector sum, which is sometimes called the resultant. Let's move now beyond addition to our first kind of multiplication with vectors, scalar multiplication. And I say our first kind of multiplication because there are actually a few different ways to multiply with vectors. Scalar multiplication is the idea of multiplying a vector by a real number. This is actually pretty intuitive here. If we take our vector v here and multiply it by the number 3, for example, then we simply multiply each component of vector v by that number 3, and we get the vector 9, 6. If we want to look at what that does physically and visually to our vector v, so here we've got vector v represented in 2D space, and if we sketch 3 times vector v at the same time, the vector 9, 6, you can see that it points in the same direction as vector v, and you might also notice that it's exactly three times as long, or we could say its magnitude has been multiplied by three as well. So that gives us an idea of what happens with scalar multiplication and positive numbers. Let's think about what it would mean to multiply a vector by a negative scalar, say negative one. If we multiply vector v by negative one, or call it negative v, then that would change the sign of all the entries, giving us negative three, negative 2. And if we sketch that in our plane here, you can see that it gives us a vector the exact same length or magnitude. It just points in exactly the opposite direction. So these vectors are still parallel. They're simply oriented 180 degrees from each other in the plane. Now imagine what happens if we add these two vectors together, vector v plus vector negative v we get a sum or resultant that has zeros for all the entries. If we want to write this using shorthand, we can write a vector that has zero for every entry as the zero vector, which is just a zero with the vector notation over it. We want to be careful and not just write the number zero. Think about the kind of objects we're working with here. We aren't adding real numbers, we're adding vectors. So our answer needs to be a vector, not a number. And so we make sure to say that this is the zero vector. If we think about what the zero vector is, well, it's a vector that goes nowhere. And so how long is this vector? Its length is also zero. We can use a scalar to change a vector to the opposite direction while also changing its length that it points in the opposite direction. Here, if we take negative 2 times vector v, we get the vector negative 6, negative 4. And we can see that this new vector points opposite v and is also twice as long. What we want to do now is run down the usual properties of vector addition and scalar multiplication that you'll likely see in some sort of box in a textbook somewhere. A lot of these are fairly common sense, but they can look intimidating when we see them all at once. So we'll talk about what they really say and mention some technical terms that are often given to them. This first one here we already mentioned earlier. This one just says that we can add vectors in any order we like and get the same answer. So adding v plus w gives us the same thing as adding w plus v. Remember, a word in math for being able to swap things on either side of the operation is called commutativity. So this says that vector addition is commutative. Next, taking any vector and adding the zero vector to it will not change the original vector. This is the idea of having an object that makes no change when you use it with addition, which we call an additive identity in math. Think about when we're doing addition with real numbers. We have a specific real number that doesn't change other numbers when we add it to them, right? It's the number zero. 
So in the same way when we're working with vectors, we also have a vector that makes no change when we add it to other vectors, and it's the zero vector. This next one here is the idea we should have an opposite when we're doing addition of vectors. If we think in terms of real numbers, if we want to add something to any real number to get an answer of zero, we just add the opposite, like adding four and negative four. This one here is just telling us that for any vector we have called v, there is a vector called negative v, and that points in the opposite direction, and that pair of vectors will have a resultant that is the zero vector. So this vector negative v we sometimes call the additive inverse of vector v. When we add a vector and its additive inverse, it gives us the additive identity, the zero vector. Next, this one on the bottom here also has a similar idea to what we have when we think of real number addition. With vectors, we can group multiple instances of addition differently and still come up with the same results. So in math, this is the idea of an operation being what we call associative, that we can change the grouping as long as everything stays in the same order. So we say that vector addition is associative. Moving up to the top here, much like where we have an additive identity with vectors, there's a vector called the zero vector that doesn't change anything when we add it. We also have a particular scalar that we can multiply a vector by that doesn't change anything. Obviously, multiplying a vector by the number 1 would not change the entries, right? So we call the scalar 1 a multiplicative identity. The next two we'll go ahead and summarize together. This is a familiar idea like we have with real numbers. We're making sure that you know that multiplication distributes over addition. Whether that's multiplication of a scalar distributing over the sum of two vectors, or a vector distributing over the sum of two scalars. And the last one here is the multiplication version of the one on the bottom over here. This is saying that how we group multiple instances in a row of scalar multiplication makes no difference. Remember, the grouping making no difference here we call associativity. And so this final item just tells us that scalar multiplication is associative. There are many of these properties that are incredibly similar to real numbers. We do want to be careful that not all properties of arithmetic with real numbers are going to apply with vectors, and additionally with matrices in general as well. We already know one big difference between arithmetic properties when it comes to real numbers and vectors. We're allowed to add any two real numbers together and get a sum, but we can't add any two vectors together, right? In order to add vectors, they need to have the same number of entries. So we want to be aware of assuming that anything you can do with real numbers, you can also do with vectors. These are different types of objects. But hopefully this list gives you a good idea of the specific things that are similar when thinking about addition and scalar multiplication at least. Alright everyone, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.